Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, presented by Geico of Mobile, the first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing reports, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm Butch Theory, and I'm joined today with Angelo DePayola as my co-host, The Coastal Connection. What's going on, Angelo? Oh man, dude, enjoying a little bit. The rain finally letting up. Yep. Got to, I got to fish for the first time in a little while yesterday. We had a pretty good trip, and man... There's light at the end of the tunnel with COVID. Stuff's opening up. Man, I'm living the dream, actually. That's right. I'm ready. I'm ready to get all this mess behind us and ready for tournament season, man. Ready to get on the boat with some friends and and catch some fish. I'm over all this mess for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, what did you guys get into yesterday fishing? Man, we did a little uh, daytime sword fishing and was blessed enough to catch two. Kept one, let one go. A few bottom fish. Saw some surface life. It was nice. Awesome. Good um, God. Good. How big was the one you guys waxed? Barely legal. That's all right. It I was, bet it tasted delicious. It, it, you know what? <laughs> it, it did. We had some last night, pan fried up with some rice and some corn. It was fine. Sounds amazing, brother. That's awesome. Did you guys check Hilton's offshore charts before you left? That's who brought us the show this week. Let's talk about that a little bit. We had Mr. Thomas Hilton on the show last week, and he sent us some screenshots of some blue water and some altimetry, some upwellings, some downwellings, and kind of gave us a lesson on all that. Did you guys uh, check that before you left yesterday? We we took a look at it. You know, with the sword fishing, it's not like Paramount to find the blue water. Right. But you know what? There is some correlation with just life, life in general. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with no that. No matter what part of the water column you're in, there's some correlation with that. I I don't know if there's any science proving that, but like I feel better when we're in blue water fishing. Even well, if you've got to check it. you got to check it before yeah. you go. And, and yeah, it sparks that conversation. We're fishing a little to the east. It was blended blue-green over there. That's what it's showing on Hilton's. That's what it looked like as we kind of worked our way back to the west. You could see it was blowing up. And, and sure enough, it was probably a little wasn't it was on the bluer side you could see a little bit more life a little bit more grass that direction and i just wonder the steps look like there was like a nice little eddy piece of body of water right there north of patronus and that's a when you get good water in that part of the gulf of mexico just because you're kind of in the bend of the continental shelf mm-hmm. it goes from 1500 feet to 300 three four hundred feet really quickly I just, we were talking about, I bet, some killer wahoo fishing up in there right now. Oh, yeah. I bet there is, too. Hopefully, some people will be able to get there and get out there and start trying that out soon. Does wind will lay down a little bit? We'll have some, I think we're going to have some good weather starting Friday. Hope so. I I bet uh, there are going to be a lot of people out on the water this weekend, enjoying the great outdoors. I bet, man. I bet everybody's chomping at the bit, for sure. Everybody's been locked up in cages for, heck, what, a month and a half now? Dude, let me tell you, man, mentally. Oh, yeah. It was, I needed that. Yeah, I bet. I bet, man. All right, man. Well, I reached out to a couple of people trying to get some information, trying to see what's going on this week. I talked to Mr. David Thornton, the peer pounder. He didn't have a peer report, but he told me to make sure to tell you guys that are in the ACFA that the uh, meetings and the tournaments can't take place, but the big fish and the CPR contests are still running. So you guys don't forget about that. Let's head on down to Chris Fetche, man. Let's see what he's been doing. He's been doing down in Orange Beach. What's been going on down there in Orange Beach, Chris? I heard some, some good news is coming up around there. Uh, huge news, finally, considering <laughs> it, our, our beaches are finally being freed up, you know, from ransom. You know, so we're going to have open beaches starting tomorrow at 5 p.m. That's, that's huge. That's been probably one of the biggest upsets, both locals and, you know, and the few tourists that are still here. That's really going to help us kind of get back to normal, which is normally April and May. Or, I mean, that's that's critical surf fishing time. So it's it's been a bummer having that closed. So as you can tell, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I know all the locals are. So, yeah, this week's going to be, you know, we're going to have a real positive note on this week for sure. That's awesome. So beach is open April 30th, Thursday, 5 correct. p.m., correct? Thursday, yep, correct. Awesome, man. Awesome. So what else is going on down there? Pump Stomp is on. I saw something about that on Facebook. Tell me about that, brother. Oh, I, man, I was waiting, waiting for the governor's little talk yesterday. And, you know, I, I think there's, there's already everybody kind of, I think, felt that they were going to open the beaches back up. So I was just, I didn't want to make a post too early. So I waited until it was pretty clear cut that beaches were going to be open. And as soon as it was, you know, I made a 
you know, made a post online that Pomp Stomp was back on. Everybody was super excited. We've been registering a lot of people the last couple of days, you know, yesterday afternoon and again this morning. So I, th- I think everybody is waiting. So that's, you know, it, it was it was nice to give that news. We had a lot of momentum with, with the tournament this year. A lot of people excited to fish. It's just, you know, it's real kind of friendly to every fisherman because Pompano, as you know, it's kind of any man's fish. It doesn't matter how good you are at catching them. You can't really dictate size. Anybody can catch a winning fish. So everybody looks forward to, to getting on the beach and, and fishing, you know, fish from the beach and around the pass, you know, every year for the tournament. And, we had a lot of momentum, a lot of people sign up early and then to have the beaches closed right prior to the start of the tournament. That, that really took the wind out of sails. What's the dates on that? Well, you know, normally we have it the full month of April, but because we had to push it back and because the beaches are opening tomorrow, we're going to do it the full month of May. So it'll start, start, you know, first thing Friday morning, May 1st, and it will continue on until the end of May. So basically, basically the last day of May is last of the fish, $25 to enter. We got a lot of good prizes. First place prizes in each category is two categories, uh, biggest fish, and then we have a three fish aggregate. And how the aggregate works, uh, this is the one that sometimes confuses some people. How the aggregate works, it's not your three biggest that you bring in all at once. It's your three heaviest pompano you weigh throughout the month. So you're always, even if you got a couple big fish weighed, you're always trying to weigh in bigger fish to keep up in your aggregate. That way, let's say you have the biggest fish. If your biggest fish gets knocked out, then you'll automatically place in first place in aggregate if you have the biggest aggregate. It'll that's how we've kind of structured the format of the tournament and how you place is that you'll always automatically get the highest position for your fish. So you you have first, second, and third in each category. Uh, you cannot win in both categories. So we automatically have six winners regardless. We've also had some prizes donated this year from a couple different tackle manufacturers. So we're gonna be doing weekly prizes as well. It'll be random, randomly drawn from the list of participants. We want as many people to win something as possible. We're also going to do a raffle at the end of the tournament for a uh, brand new beach cart from Sea Strength Tackle. Um, that's something that they they donate to us this year as well. So between that and our our normal prizes, I mean, there's there's a lot of good stuff to win. That's awesome, man. That's exciting. I'm ready ready for the guys to get back out there and start seeing some pictures of some more Pompano. If people want to sign up for this or get a ticket, what's the best way to do that? You can either, I don't have an online registry. That's just one of those things I never got set up, but you can, you can call us at the store to register over the phone. That's 251-981-4245. Or you can come by the store seven days a week, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. And, and sign up and register. And then as far as weighing fish in, you do have to bring your fish to the store to weigh in. Now, if you're not fishing, you know, let's say you, you normally fish Dolphin Island or you fish uh, Perdido Key or whatever, and you, you know, you don't want to have to drive over every time. I've kind of allowed it to where if you have a couple big fish you want to win, you know, put them on ice, give me a call, let me know you have some fish already. That way, if you want to fish another day before coming over, you can. I just need to be notified. That way you don't bring me, you know, bring me some fish that look like they've been taken right. out of a freezer. You know what I mean? <laughs> Certainly. So, that's that's pretty much it. But other than that, it's register uh, over the phone or in the store and bring the fish to the store to weigh in. Well, that's great news, man. Let's uh, let's talk fishing a little bit. What what you been up to? You've been you've been what you been chasing? Dude, I've had a mix of things. I mean, I, I've been fishing some, but this week I had to do a lot of adulting. That's the worst. I'm learning more and more about. Yeah, I'm learning more and more about it as I get older. And I'm learning that belting <laughs> isn't isn't something I really want to do. But I've got a little bit of inshore fishing this week. Caught some nice redfish, a couple of really nice trout in the you know kind of mid twenty inch range. I tried to do some head head hunting for some you know truly big fish, but normally this time of year I'm on the beach, you know, either sight fishing or walking and fishing the close in troughs or big trout, and that's something that I won't be able to do until you know until. Well, it'll be Saturday before I can get on the beach, but that's normally what I try to do this time of year is fish big trout in the surf. Chris, like what part of the beach are you kind of towards like Gulf Shores, Fort Morgan area? Like uh, it's always something I've, I always hear the people that's grown up and like the true locals that, that grew up over here in the south end of Baldwin County fishing. Fishing the beach, what's that entail? A lot of people, I think, misunderstand when they first got it. I think they have more of a surf fishing, a generic surf fishing approach to it. But you actually, you don't want big, long surf rods. You want seven, seven and a half foot, the same six years in shore fishing from the boat. Most of those trout are going to be in the first troughs, the closest troughs to the beach. 
So when you see, you know, when I see somebody walking out to the beach and they first thing they do is they go strolling into that trough and walk onto the bar and try to wait out where the waves are, they went past the fish. Most of those fish are going to be in that first trough. Now, later in the day, they usually will move out and you can fish them out on the outsides of cuts and uh, little breaks in the bar, much like you would for Pompano. But instead of fishing set rigs, I'm, I'm fishing 100% artificial lures, mostly plugs. I like hard baits over soft baits when I'm fishing the surf because you have a lot of blues, ladyfish, things that are going to tear up your soft baits. Hard baits have a real good signature on the water as far as between vibration, flash. They get a lot of attention. And they don't get torn up as easy. So I mostly use big twitch baits and jerk baits and then also top waters, you know, when it's when it's applicable. Chris, what kind of conditions, like, I'm just thinking I wouldn't mind going out there and doing that. And what kind of conditions are you looking for? Angelo, you know, there's, first off, you saying you wouldn't mind doing that. You have my phone number. <laughs> uh, I, you're, you're welcome. To, you're welcome to come trout fish pieces with me whenever you, you know, you just got to let me know when. But as far as conditions, I think a lot of people get the impression that that's something you have to do on relatively calm days, and it's really not. I would say some of my best days I've ever had fishing beach trout have been when there's actually a fair amount of surf action. And just to recall a day, I was actually telling my boss about this other day, and he was, he was like, I don't know how you remember dates like this. But my best day ever fishing the beach for, for speckled trout was on June 17th, 2003. And one of the things that stands out, not only because of the, the amount of fish and the quality of the fish I caught that morning, but the main thing is it was it was rough as hell. It was not calm by any means. Water was kind of milky. Uh, it had a green color to it, but you know the, the conditions were definitely not ideal. But there was so much bait that was being worked into those troughs. The tide had just turned, had just started coming in. And we had so much bait filling these little pockets down a little section of beach about a mile past West Pass and Gulf Shores. And the trout were just in there about as thick as it gets. It was awesome action. I would I would have traded a lot of different, you know, offshore tuna fish and whatever to experience that bite with those big trout. That's fun. You definitely need to do that if you've never done much of that, Angelo. It's fun, buddy. Man, I want to. I've got to get more into it. Sounds like an invite to me. You just got I one. I am. I just need to wake up. What time <laughs> what time do we have to wake up, Chris? Oh God. Uh, here's where you're gonna <laughs> well, <laughs> anybody that I've ever taken will tell you that yeah, yeah, I could tell you we're going early morning. It's really more like we're gonna go at night and stay till early morning. Because I'm usually on the beach by say four thirty in the morning. I mean it's still it's still blackout when I'm working those troughs and I do a lot of scouting ahead of time, you know, to find out okay, there's holes here, there's a nice break in the bar there. Because if you can get there while it's still dark and fish those spots. It's not that you won't catch fish when that sun comes up, but that big girl, that, you know, eight, you know, eight plus pound fish that might be in there, you have a way better chance of catching her on the pitch black than you do once that sun comes up. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer. I'm a big believer in getting there early, but if you want to sleep a little later, we can wait till, you know, say five o'clock to go. No, no, I want to go catch fish. I'm going to wake up early. <laughs> you could take you a nap. You could take you a nap a little later, Angelo. You'll be yeah. fine. All right, Well, Chris, that's one know. of the best things about it. One of the best things about it is I'm usually done fishing by 9 o'clock. You know, I can go home, either get something done or take, like you said, take a little power nap, you know, before the day starts. I mean, I'm I'm off the sand before, you know, the anthill gets kicked over and all the people start flooding out on the beach. So, Yeah, that's my kind of fishing schedule as well. Well, you know, we got to get that tip from you this week. This week's tip is brought to us by Killer Doc, man. Killer Doc is raffling off one of these tables, by the way. You now have a chance to win a Killer Doc at $50 per ticket. They're going to do a raffle for a the proceeds support Ben Dunham's immediate family. It's They're doing a tournament down on Dauphin Island. It's the Ben Dunham Red Snapper Shootout. You guys, to purchase a ticket, you have to go to app.fishingchaos.com. You have to register for the tournament and then select Killer Doc Raffle and add the number of tickets you want. You guys go on Facebook, go to Killer Doc, and check out that Ben Dunham Red Snapper Shootout. I'll share this flyer on our Facebook page as well. If you guys are interested, $50 ticket to win a thousand plus dollar fish clan table is a pretty dang good deal if you ask me. I think I'm willing to take that chance. I like it. What you think for a tip this week, Chris? Well, I mean, we're talking about beach fishing. We've been talking about trout. We've been talking about pompano. I'm going to say, I'm going to pick a few. I'm going to have, you know, Angelo's asked me about conditions. All right, so I'm going to give, say, three or four 
But I'm just going to say my, my biggest tips, the things I look for when I'm going to head out on the beach, whether it's really, it doesn't matter if I'm fishing for trout or pumping or whatever, there's a few key things I always look for every single time I hit the beach. So why don't we, why don't we go into that? One is, you know, one of the questions I get asked most is tide. Which tide do I prefer? And the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, incoming or outgoing, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you need tide movement, but it's more of the key phase of it. I always try to be on the beach within the first, you know, try to touch that first couple hours of the tide swing. It's usually when the when the peak bite is, you know, all the fish have settled after feeding from the last tide. You get that slack period where they get kind of lethargic and scattered about. And when that tide starts to move again, it's almost like the dinner bell being rung and things start to get kicked up as that tide moves and the fish, you know, that, that, that feet is going to peak again. So I'd always say it's not so much the incoming or outgoing, but that, that first couple hours of the tide change is what I look for the most. My other tip is activity. This may seem like common sense, but, you know, if I see any kind of activity, whether it's, you know, larger schools of mullet in one area blue runners, you know, pop in a certain area. There's a reason why fish will tend to, you know, go to one spot over another. Even if it's not the species you're looking for, usually, you know, current changes, rips and and things like that, or even a little temperature break is going to, you know, draw those kinds of aggregations. So, you know, when you get in that spot where there's a bunch of small fish, you know, just kind of popping the top or moving around, that's always going to be a good spot to fish. A lot of guys will get into lady fish, things like that, and they'll think they need to move. They're like, well, this isn't where the trout are or whatever. They're there for the same reasons the trout are there. So yeah, I'm going to fish those spots. Yeah, you just got to you gotta take the good with the bad, deal with some lady fish and blues. That's where your trophy trout is. He's in there feeding as well. So that's what I'm always going to say. Next thing is, you know, don't be afraid to, to move. You know, don't sit in one spot on the beach. Don't, you know, don't wait for that bite to happen. If you've been there for two hours and you haven't seen anything go by, you haven't had a single bite. Beach fishing is, to me, it's, it's good exercise. I mean, you, you need to constantly move to try to find spots that are holding fish and producing fish. And that's, I think that's why I like fishing artificials the most on the beach is it keeps me constantly moving, constantly mm. looking for those better spots. But if I'm, if I'm in an area for more than say, 45 minutes to an hour tops and I haven't got a bite. My feet are, my feet are on the move again. I'm going somewhere else. And so, I mean, you know, fish that tide change, always look for any kind of fishy condition whatsoever. Even if it's not something that might be apparent to you or or obvious, you know, anything that looks like there's some activity, you know, follow that. You see a little slick on the surface. You see a couple mullet jumping, you know, fish that area. And if you don't get a bite quick, get on your feet and move. I like it, man. It's a great segment, chock full of tips, Chris. We appreciate it, man. You guys give Chris yes, a call sir. at Sam's and go see him and get a ticket to the Palm Stop. That's right. I think it's going to be the way the Palm Stop has been biting this year already again this week. You know, we're coming into, we're about, I think, seven or eight days out on the full moon. Those Palm Stop are no doubt going to go on the spawn again right around that period. I think for the next, I would fully expect for the next, you know, eight to nine days, we're going to have a really stellar bite on Pompano again. So if you're thinking about entering the tournament, you think of a better start than a uh, full moon spawn. I mean, it's the numbers are already here. People are already just, you know, catching a ton of them. 25 bucks. Think of, think of all the things you've wasted $25 on in your life that you got nothing for. At least now <laughs> you're going fishing anyway. You have something, you know, you might have something to show for it. That's right. I like it. Man, I'm ready to see people on the beach again. Me too. Oh, you absolutely. Gonna, absolutely. You fishing this weekend? I mean, you're going to be you're going to be fishing a jig or a set rig. What you going to catch the big girl on? Me personally, I'm always fishing a jig. I I I'm just not much of a uh, set rig person. I mean, we're we're catching too many on jigs right now. Just to throw in another thing, you know, everybody keeps asking me about which jig. And it seems like a lot of people are getting real picky, you know, saying, "Oh, well, it needs to be this particular jig, this particular color." Look, in the last three weeks, I've caught pompano on probably eight different colors, probably know, seven or eight different types of jigs. They're not as picky as we are. So, right. you know, anything that has a bright hue to it, whether it's orange, pink, yellow, or even just white. I mean, we caught a bunch of them on just white jigs the other day. You know, don't give the fish too much credit. Just give them something, something to cue in on, something in the general color scheme, and you should be able to catch them. But, no, for me, it's always going to be a jig. Man, Perfect. we used to catch them on gotcha plugs growing up. I mean, that. It's moving. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you were to like, you know, if you were to look through my uh, my Instagram feed, you'll see a lot of pompano I've caught in the past on 
you know, different twitch baits. I've got them on top waters. I mean, they're, they are a jack. I know a lot of people like to deny them that, but it's, I mean, that's all there is to it. They're still a jack. They do jack things. The all tackle world record was caught on a top water plug. So, you <laughs> know, crazy. they, they will absolutely hit all kinds of lures. Awesome, dude. Well, I hope you guys have a great turnout and we look forward to seeing the results of that pop stop. I'll know I'll be keeping up with it. Good luck, buddy. I'm sure we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Later, Chris. All right, Angelo. I like talking to Chris, man. That, dude, that was a that was a segment chock full of tips. Every single thing he said was a tip. That dude knows his stuff. I like talking to him. Dude is methodical when he, he is. about what he does. Yeah, he's got it figured out for sure. Man, Angelo, I can't imagine what you know what it would be be like being locked up with kids right now at this time. I bet you guys are going crazy over there. Dude, let me tell you, <laughs> when I got home last night, my wife looked halfway crazy. <laughs> the the house was a minor war zone slash tornado disaster area. I've done it. I've stayed at home myself with them. It's, I mean, Pan- everybody pandemic. loves their kids, but they oh, cool. will grind on you. Oh yeah, I'm sure. The CCA is doing a, I don't know if you've seen it yet. Maybe you need to download these. They're doing a coastal coloring contest. I know you've heard of the Bonnie fly. He does some super, super cool designs. They have three different divisions right now grades k through two and then there's a three through seven and an eight through eleven so it's three different contests so age groups aren't competing against each other you can download the artwork and then after you after your you know your kids color it you can upload it onto the contest page on the cca alabama.org website yeah you have to check that out man they got some really cool prizes the prizes are for all three categories so each category is going to get their own prize first prize is a coaster backpack which is really cool a copy of Dr. Bob Ship's book, The Guide to the Fishes of the Gulf of Mexico, a CCA hat and a T-shirt, and a limited edition signed print of the Bonnie Fly. Dude, do, what a great, what a know. great package! Yeah, I was looking at some of the pictures earlier, man. He does some really, really cool stuff. That that artwork, that Costa backpack is sweet. I have one of those. I grew up. It was funny. Me and my dad, like, because we just really hadn't seen each other since. So it's like the stay at home order thing. And like we were actually one of the things he misses about being away from his granddaughter, my four year old, is like he got me one of those Bob Ship books mm-hmm. when I was a kid. I used to trace, you know, trace over the, the pictures and stuff. Now I'm not sure about she is learning how to stay within the lines. But yep. She'll get there, man. Well, the deadline, yeah. the, the deadline for submissions on that is May 7th. Voting ends May 8th. You guys go to www.ccaalabama.org and go to the Coastal Coloring Contest and get that done. Man, what a great deal. Agreed. All right, Angela. Get the inshore report, man. I'm pumped up about this. I know fishing's been good. It's been a good year so far. Let's head on down to Dolphin Island area. Who knows where he's been? The Marshall of the Mississippi Sound. What you say, Captain Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, that is some great news about the beaches opening. I know those guys over there really are, you know, really, all, everybody's looking forward to it. I mean, let's face it, you know, but I mean, those guys that, that do that beach fishing, which just fascinates the heck out of me. I'm just so tickled that they're going to be able to get back out there and do what they like to do, you know? Yeah, me too. The Bama Beach Bum's been foaming at the mouth. I know that. He's ready to get out there. He's been the Bama, the Bama Beachless Bum lately. We've been making fun of him. Poor guy. God, that's <laughs> torture, man. That's torture. I know it. That poor guy, man. What uh, you been up to, buddy? You been chasing the well, trouts well, or the reds or what? All of the above, yeah. We Mainly, I get mostly trout. You know, we get trout on the brain this time of year, as we do most of the year. So most of my trout uh, trips have been trout trips and, you know, with some reds. You know, mixed in either by accident or some of the days when we really caught the trout early that, you know, they'll, we'll go try and catch some redfish and they've been pretty reliable too, you know, but, uh, that, you know, like you kind of let in with there, the fishing has just really been good. And probably since the last time I was on, it's continued to be as good, if not, you know, not better than the last time we talked. There's a lot of spawning activity going on right now. And we're finding these schools of trout that are just balled up in wads where you're catching you know, these big, big schools of male trout mixed in with the female trout. And, and it's, you know, three or four weeks ago, the fish I was keeping had little kind of tiny thin row sacks. And the ones that we're catching, keeping now, the few that I'm cleaning that have the, the row sacks are just huge. Now they're the size of a cigar, even in, you know, we don't keep anything bigger than 20 inches, but even like the 15 to 18 inch trout that we're keeping the females are just have giant row sacks in them and so that's just telling you that they're really in this peak spawn right now and that's really going to probably peak coming up in the next couple of three weeks 
you'll have one of the major spawns when it gets, you know, if everything comes together like it should, the full moon in May is kind of one of the peak spawns of the year. And man, everything's in place for it to really be a good one. You know, if you keep up with the river stages, you know, we, the rivers went back in flood, the upstate rivers, the Tom and the, and the Alabama went into flood, but they both crested and very scheduled to crest by the, well, really probably today or tomorrow mm-hmm. at just under 13 feet. And, and, the, and they, they all fall out there showing to fall out really fast so that's the only downside is the bay had cleared up to the point that we're actually catching some fish at the mouth of the bay that's going to go bad that's going to be bad for a little while but down in the sound areas anything west of the dolphin Island bridge you know all the way around to the gulf beaches on the west end and all the way into mississippi the mississippi marsh down there it's just got beautiful water and it you know it's just really it's perfect water it's not too clear and it's not too muddy and when i ran back up i fished dolphin island yesterday and and I ran back up and you hit, start to hit some off color water about Katrina Cut heading back east. But even I caught fish all the way back to the island, even in, you know, not great water, but it was plenty salty enough, obviously, to catch fish. And so it's about as bad as it's going to get right now. So it's only going to continue to improve. But there were fish all the way from, from Dolphin Island, from the island, the bridge, all the way down to the very west end, all along the, the beaches and the a little bit of structure that's down there in the former reefs and that sort of thing. And I'm still using all artificial bait. I'm going to probably be at a point, you know, probably too much longer. I'm going to have to go to the dark side and start carrying some live bait. It just happens mm-hmm. every time. That, you know, you know, and I, I basically compare notes with Richard and Patrick and my brother and a couple of the other people just to kind of see, cause they're, they'll use live bait, just kind of compare notes with them. And I see now that my trip, you know, when I'm starting to compare with my trips are starting to get, their trips are starting to get closer to mine now. So I'm right. like, Oh, well, I guess, I'm going to have to break down and get some shrimp, which ain't a bad deal. I don't mind getting it if it's easy to get. You know, I don't like chasing it all over the place, and I haven't had to, but uh, everything we're doing right now is on all artificial bait. We caught trout yesterday. My first was my first wade trip of the spring. We caught trout on slick lures and topwater baits. Uh, topwater baits are early, and then slick slicks, you know, when the sun kind of got up a little bit, we switched over to slick lures and caught them uh, wade fishing and then got in the boat and fished some of the reefs using grubs and caught fish doing that and then got back towards the island and fished some of the shell back that way with voodoos under popping corks and caught them that way and the voodoo popping cork thing and top water on the north end of the sound up in the marsh the grand bay area and down into almost into mississippi that's kind of been the deal there it's uh that's all real shallow grass flats and Man, that booty just gets it done with that. We use a Fairhope rattle popping cork, and that rig I got them on when I'm especially over in that area. Got that's about you know just about every rod's got that set up tied on right now. That's awesome. Any particular color on the slick lures? Yeah, uh, well, we, early in the morning we were using my, my the, the one he got named after me, which is the one that I use most of the time is the B cat, which is the mm-hmm. uh, pearl and chartreuse tail. And but then I switched over to he's a new color he's got out called Cold Night, which is kind of a purple. I don't know, it's kind of a translucent purple with the chartreuse tail. And you could really see as the sun got up to where that lure started really working a little bit better than the B cat. But those were the two that we, you know, the, what we started up off with and ended up with those are the two only two i use so but you know just basically basically it looks like you just go into a su- more subtle color when the sun gets up a little bit mm-hmm. that day i went wade, wade fishing with richard that's what i was whacking him on was a cold night and redfish were loving it <laughs> yeah that's, i'll tell you what he's on to something with that color i really yeah. i'm partial to that chartreuse tail because the cold night and the cool beans are the same color, except the cold night's got the chartreuse tail. And I just imparse, I just love that chartreuse tail. And, um, you know, even though I catch plenty, I've caught plenty of fish on the cool beans, I just, something about that chartreuse tail, I just think it, the fish pick up on it from a little bit further away with that little flick of that, that chartreuse tail seems to make a difference, you know. As, as a very novice inshore angler what is it about the colors i mean like was it water conditions is you said something about daylight about sunlight it just so it's this is very it just found that very interesting that that certain days certain conditions you know is it what they're feeding on well it is but you know that's a good question about the cut you know the color selection and the condition of the water and the in the you know and, and of course you whether it's offshore, inshore, pond fishing, it you know it, it it you know nothing's exact, but typically, typically my color selection is the more off color the water is, or the the lower the light is. In other words, like early in the morning or cloudy days or off color water, the brighter color I use 
and white to me really reflects the most light because what you're trying to do is the fish has got to see the lure. It doesn't do you any good if he doesn't see it, you know? Mm. So, and I think with that white or that pearl, you get a lot of, lot more light reflection off of it, which lets the fish see the lure from further away. The downside to that is I've never seen a pearl white mullet, you know? So (laughs) what, what happens is, I think is you, you got, you have to go when the more the fish can see the lure, the more natural the lure has got to look too. So you got to cut, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword. You want them to see it, but you don't want, you, you know, what they see has got to look natural. So, you know, what happens is you start putting that pearl white out there on a bright, you know, when the sun got up, like it did with us yesterday and we were in really clear water, that white is just, it doesn't look natural to them. They're seeing it, but they're going like, Oh, I, that yeah, ain't the heck is that? nothing I want to eat. Yeah, what the heck is that? It's a piece yeah. of plastic. So you go to a more subtle or a more natural color. So, you know, general rule of thumb for me is the clearer the water, the more natural, the more I want to make that the lure selection I'm going to be is something as close as I can to what they're feeding on, which down there is on, you know, or, or really is anywhere is on is mullet. So I get something that's closer to, you know, that type of prey. So that's how I pick my color. So that's, that's kind of the general rule of thumb. Now, sometimes it'll be bass backwards. You go like, they shouldn't be hitting this in the middle of the day, but they do. Cause, mm-hmm. and you know that that's from offshore fishing, pond yeah. fishing, inshore salt water. They'll make it, they'll make you look like a monkey, but 80% of the time it's an 80, 20 deal. About 80% of the time that usually works, you know, mm-hmm. the more natural, the, the clearer the water, the more natural, uh, more natural. I want the bait to look. Makes sense for sure. Whenever you're waiting the beast down there, I'm getting into wade fish and I enjoyed that the other day. What are you looking for mostly? Are you mostly looking for bait? Are you mostly looking for a bar with breakers? What are you looking for whenever you approach a wade setup? That that combination of those two things is what I'd like ideally like to bait for sure. Bait absolutely one hundred percent life out. But yeah, just life, exactly. To see a lot of bait. I like to see a lot of service activity. You know, sometimes on the really easy days they'll give themselves away because they're knocking the bait out of the water that's easy to find but they're going to be around those rafts of mullet small mullet they're going to be around that so that's that's number one and then number two is what you said was bars and so what i do is i look for places because they're ambush feeders if they can if they can set up to where they can ambush prey by you know being on the edge of a bar the tip of a point or something like that to where they can ambush it that makes it easier for them to feed so if you can find that combination of those two things that's that's what i'm looking for when i did just to get out on a just a flat sand flat you know with very little or no bait you're, you're really probably you're making it hard on yourself you know mm-hmm. you're, you're not you're gonna have probably have some fish some roman fish but you're not gonna have the concentration of fish that you'd like to have and you know keeping in mind when you weight fish it's not like in a boat it, same thing i guess along the lines of a kayak is you better you better be pretty well narrowed down to where you're gonna be because you can't just jump you know make 10 casts and jump in your boat and run 50 miles an hour three miles away and, and start fishing again <laughs> it ain't like right, that it's you know, a pretty you big setup get, You've got, yeah, that's right. It's a pretty, you know, every move is a pretty big move. So, I mean, it's a pretty involved move. So, you know, especially if you're trying to do this clear water, you know, the low light is always the best. You know, you really want to make sure that you're, you know, you try to get on, you know, I'm doing air quotes here, your A spot, you know, at daylight, that's the spot you want to be on. And so, you you know, and, and that's, that's a thing that kind of you develop a little bit more, you know, as you get more into the spring, you get a better feel for where everything is and stuff, you know, and, but sure. yeah, that's what I look for. Those two things that you just mentioned. See, see how awesome. good you're getting at it already. That's dude? right. You hey, already I'm got trying, it man. Now, man. If I hang around you, you guys for much longer, I might be able to catch speckled trout every now and again. <laughs> oh, I know, but I've seen you in action, dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Captain Bobby, you know, we got to get that tip from you. This week's inshore tip is brought to us by MDH Foundation Repair. If your home is experiencing foundation problems, MDH Foundation Repair has the best solutions to fix it right and fix it now. The problems you see are only going to get worse. So don't deal with inefficient, unqualified, and pushy salesmen trying to sell you overpriced foundation repair products. The professionals at MDH Foundation will ensure you have a remarkable experience from the first meeting to the finished product. MDH Foundation Repair is redefining the construction industry and protect your most important asset, your home. Check them out at mdhfoundationrepair.com. What do you think for a tip this week, bud? Well, you know, just kind of on the heels of what we were just talking about, you know, I do I do as much weight fish as I can when I got the right crew and the conditions allow for it. And we were talking about getting dialed in or, or you know, maximizing your time when you're doing that kind of fish. And, it, and one of the techniques we use is, or that I use 
I don't really have a name for it. It's kind of a hopscotch technique. But what we do, you know, if you have like, let's just use the West End of Dolphin Island as an example, you got eight miles of productive water down there, you know, and that's a lot of water to cover. So you want to, you know, the more you can cover and get dialed in where the fish are, obviously the more you're going to catch. And so what we do is, and you have to have the right people, the right crew with you. But what we do a lot of times is let's just say we have a crew of four of us, me and three others. What I do is I'll put two guys out on the beach and take the boat, run out, you know, 90 degrees from the beach, run out two or 300 yards and then run down the beach a quarter mile or so, which is not a really, to me, is not a real long wait. I'm, I'm notorious about making like two mile wades, you know, it's easy what to this do. does. Yeah. It's, you get carried away. And I did yeah. it yesterday. I had, you know, a wait yesterday where I know I was a mile from the boat. That's a mile down and a mile <laughs> back. But what I'll do is we'll go down about, you know, 400 yards or so, you know, a, a medium length wade and pull the boat back up to the beach that those two guys jump out and start wading. And so when the guy's we're wading towards the boat. They jump in the boat, do the same thing. And just, we can work a lot of beach in a fairly short period of time. And if somebody, somebody hits on fish, you can either wave when they're riding by, or I carry now just a little cheap, you know, little walkie talkie things you can mm-hmm. get now for about 30 bucks. You, you hunters use them and stuff. And so we just get, and those things have plenty of range. And so if somebody hits, you just kind of pull the boat in there and now you're on the fish, you know, and it's really a, it's really a great technique, particularly early in the period where we're at right now. The water's cool. It's got a warm, and really, as it warms up, it's going to even get a little bit better. But, you know, in this period right now, you know, it's, you really have to, it takes a little while to kind of get dialed into where everything is, you know, until I'm down, you know, you're down there doing it a bunch. And it, what it does is it lets you just cover the water. Then probably by the next day or two days later, you get dialed in enough where you don't even have to do that. You can just pretty much go to where you you know, we're going to be able to catch fish, you know? So anyway, it's, I've never seen anybody do it before. I don't know if we invented it or what, but it's yeah. a great way to cover a whole bunch of water without, and to cut down on the amount of walking you have to do. Absolutely. It's not easy to walk in those waders. I know the water's still a little it, bit chilly. It does. I can't do waders. I, I had, I went in the uh, guys I had yesterday, one, two, uh, I think two, two of them, I think had waders and I had, I brought my waders and running down in the morning, it was cool, you know, running before daylight, but Man, if I can get in that water, if I can just get in the water, yeah. you know, and, and slowly get the Captain Bobo meter wet. <laughs> That's um, right. You know, you still if I can quick. do it. You know, yeah, you know, it, but once you're in and moving, especially if you start catching fish, you don't think about it. You know, the only time it gets really cool then is when you get back in the boat and have to make a run. And I just, we, you know, I leave a sweatshirt laying there on the on the console and throw it on until we jump back in the water again. But the problem is when we made that long wade yesterday is you got to walk back in waders which i mm. walked back and got the boat they didn't have to do it but if i'd had my waders on man i would have been exhausted walking back so if i can get away without wearing waders i'm going to do it you know yep. it's a personal call you know what you like to do but i, I typically you know it's going to have to really be cold for me to wear waders yeah me too and if it's that cold we don't need to be fishing in the water anyways <laughs> exactly right that's right you're oh, right man that's a great report as always man we appreciate you being on if people want to book a trip with you i'm sure you're getting booked up for summer what's the best way to get in touch with you uh, the easiest way is just go to the website which is 18 all, all one word a and it's got a contact us tab that you can either use the phone number off there and call or just fill out the little online form give us the date you want and so forth and we'll get back to you but we're booked i'm booked solid for may uh and but i still i know i just took a call for some trips in june i got some dates in june but um you know give us a call we'll uh we'll get you fixed up awesome man sounds great i'm gonna get a weight trip with you for sure let's get that done absolutely absolutely man i'd love to do that Dump right. me in for that butch that sounds all right. like you got it Angelo. you right. got it you got that's it that's a deal all right all right, Captain Bobby, we appreciate you being on, and we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Keep whacking them. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Man, well, let's round this thing off with a good offshore report. Let's head on down to Captain Dustin Bedgood, Orange Beach, Alabama, with Fed Up Charters. What you say, Captain Dustin? Hey, guys. How are y'all today? Man, we are all right. Now the rain and the storms are out of here a little bit, trying to see a little sunshine soon in the future, man. What you been up to? Yeah, I've been doing a little fishing. Done some inshore fishing this week. Got to go offshore a little bit. Went out uh, yesterday and planned on going sword fishing, but it turned into a little, we did some grouper fishing. And had a good day at it. It was a good backup plan for us. Where'd you guys go after them swords? I know you say you didn't get to do very much of it, but I'm just looking for water clarity report kind of. 
Oh, yeah, we, we went all out. We went out to the edge, just kind of south. We went by Patrona, looked at Patrona and Marlin. Both of those, you know, both of those areas were real pretty water. The blue water was just south of Patronus when I saw it. I had, uh, I actually took my parents and my mom, we, you know, we prepared. She got a patch to put on. I got a, you know, for somebody to call a patch in for her and she, she put one on and then put a new one on the day of. And, but as soon as we got there, within five minutes or so of being out offshore, as soon as we stopped the boat, she was sick. And oh, no. not long after that, not long after that, my sister got sick too. And it kind of, and I knew I had to leave then and, you know, try to get somewhere for that better than them. So I ran back north up into some shallower water and started doing some uh, tile fishing and grouper fishing. Nice. What'd you guys get into? Caught some tile fish. We were fishing about 900 foot of water, just kind of letting the, you know, we were just kind of, we were only fishing two rods. So I just alternated my weight a little bit, fishing in about 900 foot of water. And I was just kind of dragging my baits up a ledge, tried a couple of different light setups. And I just found a green glowing light or either just a glow stick was what was working best. And I was baiting with squid for the tile fish and kind of dragging it up the lead. We caught a couple, not as big as the tile fish we've been catching. We've been catching some really nice ones, you know, just, you know, doing the same technique in the same areas and that same, you know, I, I fished for them out to about 1200 foot where I caught some really nice ones, the deeper waters where I've caught the bigger ones. And I found those catching them on my sword bait. You know, we caught a couple of those, but I really wasn't marking the bait like I had been you know, in the last few times I went there. So we just kind of moved on from that. I was just trying to keep the boat in the waves, you know, trying to keep it as calm as possible. We worked our way up the hill a little bit more and got into some uh, yellowish grouper. And we did pretty good on those. And, you know, we were catching them pretty good. A few sharks. And then, but we were catching those using a little different tactic. We were fishing with red meat. No, we didn't fish. I didn't even, you know, use any squid or anything. I just went just with red meat. They seemed to like that. Not we didn't really catch any any other any kind of trash or anything. It was just the groupers. It was a lot of fun. Had a good time. It was a good backup plan. If I'd have had more live bait, you know, the scamps would be a good too. If I'd have had more live bait, I think we could have really, really worked on them. I don't know if it was a time of day that I got there or what, but they were, you know, when we let when we used our last live bait, you know, we hooked up two or three fish on that drop. One on a diamond jig. One on a dead bait and one on a live bait. Hmm. Um, and that was our last bait. Let me ask you this. Like, A, where are you catching your live baits at right now? I was catching them right – I caught them right off the beach in Orange Beach. I like to get out in about 30 foot of water and just drift around until I mark them. But on the on the buoy, the buoy was holding a few cigar minnows, and there was a few – and there were some hardtails there. They were a little bit big. But I, I, I continued to fish with those baits, but I was drifting the beach and I was finding these big schools of thread fins or greenbacks. And I was catching as many of those as I could. My deck hand didn't get to go with me that afternoon. So I was by myself catching bait. But, you know, I was just drifting. And when I would get with those schools, I would, you know, the boat set up with a, it has Optimus on it. So I kind of, I can lock it in kind of like you do your trolling motor and it'll hold me in the current and I can pitch and catch those baits as long as they stay there. But they're, those thread fans were moving pretty good. Wished I could have caught more of them and thought I had more people. But the bait's really close. I was having pretty good success catching bait. Let me ask you this. We were out there fishing yesterday, and uh, we're doing the daytime swordfish thing, and Adam Peoples is out there. We had Tim Klein mm-hmm. on the boat, so we had some sure enough killers on our boat. We didn't get any bites, and neither did Adam until a little after one. I was just wondering, like, did that correlate for you guys, grouper fishing? It was earlier than that. They, the grouper were really biting good about 10 o'clock. I hear you. And, I mean, they could have continued to bite good later, but we were gone. You know, we were already headed back, you know, not long after that. But I, I was thinking, you know, I've been tell, I've had a bunch of people call me about fishing this weekend. I'm going to be fishing a lot this weekend. I'm going to be doing a good bit of sword fishing. And I've had people ask me, you know, when they need to be sword fishing or whatever. I'm like, you know, yeah, it's a middle of the day thing. That's that's the, the, the moon, the moon setting up, you know, it's the middle. Of, it's, you need to be fishing in the middle of the day. I told a friend of mine, I was like, you need to have your bait down at lunchtime, one o'clock this weekend, have your bait down. Don't you know, you don't this. don't lollygag. Let me ask you this, because I always find there's a correlation, and yesterday was a really good example of it. We had a really nice bluebird day yesterday with high pressure, and I always feel like grouper fishing is really good when you had high pressure, and we really had it kind of leading in today where it had low pressure. I mean, I would have thought the bite would have been, and we did a little deep dropping yesterday. And it was open. We didn't set the world on fire. We caught a handful of mm-hmm. fish. But what but what's been your experience? with how pressure affects the group so i mean i not that i am 
a master at them by any means, but I think it has a lot more to do with the moon than it does anything. The pressure definitely the pressure affects all fish. So you can and I, I see that, you know, fishing for everything. Inshore, you know, you see it all the way out and it definitely affects them, but I I don't think I know enough about it to, you know, a, a great answer on that. Well look, we're coming into Amber Jacks season. Yep. Opens May one, right? Jacks. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we, we were catching jacks deep, dropping pretty good. We caught two really nice, you know, they would have been keeper amber jacks and an Almaco too. But yeah, we do a little bit. You know, we don't we don't get after them real hard, but we do. You know, if, if somebody wants to go catch them, we can usually go make it happen. I like to go out and get over some uh, natural bottom and stuff and catch them on jigs, and you know, not have to use as heavy a tackle where you got to keep them out of a structure or off a rig. But I'm sure this first weekend, any of the rigs out in 200 foot of water or more should be pretty good. You know, you should be able to. I would think you should be able to find them uh, fairly easily this weekend. I mean, I, I don't. I'm not catching as many now as I normally do, but you know, it's not something that I do. I only do it really on request. I'm not a. You know, I, they they fight too hard for me. First off, um, <laughs> it, it's just you know, it's it's a hard fight, I and mean, they they don't they're not going to give up. They like to. And I know a lot of people really, they really like to do that. And you know, I enjoy it sometimes, but I do like to catch them on a spinning rod with a diamond jig, not a diamond jig, but a knife jig or something, a real heavy jig. I seem to have pretty good success doing that over natural bottom and not fishing the structures as much. All right. Well, that's, I like this. I like this. Let's talk Amberjack a little bit. I guess both you guys, Angelo, I can ask you the hay cap question too. This week's hay cap is brought to us by Foster Contracting. The recent thunderstorms that have been producing wind and hail in the area may have damaged your home's roof. The certified roofing pros at Foster Contracting offer free roof inspections, and if your roof has received damage, most homeowners will have little or no cost out of pocket when going through your insurance. If you are looking for quality construction with a dependable, licensed, and fortified roofing professional, give the fortified roofing pros a call at 251-973-9999. They're a family-owned business that is big enough to get the job done, but small enough to care. Rem- remember to support the local businesses that make your local podcast possible and check them out at fortifiedroofingpros.com. This week's Hey Cap question is from Chris Vicks. He actually says, hey Cap, let's talk Amberjack. It's kind of a multi-part question. You just said something about 200 foot. He said, what about depth? What do you think, Angelo? What's your what's your go-to depth, or where do you start out for Amberjack? This weekend, you can't catch some in those sh- shallower rigs in the 200-foot range. It's going to get pretty hard probably after this weekend would be my guess because they're just going to get hammered. Everybody's been cooked up. Everybody's itching to go out. And like Justin said, man, if you're looking to tie into a freight train, they fight real good. Uh, they ain't the bad people yeah. there either. For me, I like I like some natural bottoms, some rocks that come up. You don't want the rocks to have low release. You eat those rocks that come up 30, 40 feet up off the bottom, those are the ones to me that are going to have the most jacks, and jacks move around with the bait. So when we talk about the relief, and you find a lot of those rocks in 300 and 400 foot of water, and you can, you know, you can use jigs, you can use a split tail jig, knife jig, and if you want to catch a really big one, I mean, the salt domes, the horseshoes, all that stuff to the southwest, you've got the Alabama Alps over there that hold big jack. And big hardtails are, are obviously a great bait, a big bluefish. And if you got a way to keep a bonito alive and you want a trophy, that's the way to go. Put a big giant bonito on, put them on a Carolina rig with about 15 feet of 100, 150-pound test leader and bent butt and let her rip. Yep. That's exactly what I would say too. I like a 15 or 18 foot leader and a Benita is the biggest, that's the biggest amberjack I've ever caught was on a Benita. Yeah. If you want to catch a big one, that's the tick. What you think, Dustin? You got anything to add to that? Structure, bait, leaders? Yeah. I, I like what Angelo said. If you want to catch a big one, definitely go over to the horseshoes or, you know, one of those spots. I mean, the biggest ones I've ever seen, that's where they come from for sure. And we caught some giants during when, you know, we were catching all the tuna over there. We were catching some giant amberjack. You know, I know a lot of them got ate by sharks during that, but there's plenty there, and and that's where I, we caught a 105 over there a few years ago when they were in season. That's the biggest one I've ever, the biggest one I've ever been a part of. But I know there's been some way bigger ones caught out there. I like, I do like to fish over the natural bottom with, you know, I like to use a hundred pound braid, eighty pound leader with a jig, you know, any kind of jig really if it's heavy enough that you can. Keep it straight up and down. I like to use it. Uh, you know, if you're fishing around a rig, you know, like Angelo said, I, I, if I'm fishing around a rig, I like to fish like I'm fishing for a giant, you know, a 50 wide or a 30 wide. 
in the rod holder. Tackle up know, when you can pull them off. Yeah, that's right. Keep I back the boat up there. When I hook the fish, I drive away and I lock the drag down. You know, and pull him away from there, and then we can pull it out and let the person fight the fish. But if I don't get him away from that structure, you're not gonna fight anything. Yeah, and if you if you have you know if you have some black fins or some bonita butterfly them or either just or just cut one side of it off and use that. I mean, whatever the biggest bait you can use. I mean, you don't want you don't want anything else to try to eat it, but you want a big bait. You know, they they got a huge mouth and they'll eat it. Especially if you can down rig, if you can down rig a live live bonita, if you can if you have the ability to keep them alive or a big hardtail. You know, put him on that down rigger and drop him down or either put a bomb on or do like Angelo said, just put a big Carolina rig with a heavy leader. But I, I've, you know, I've had more success on the rigs of losing tackle than I have catching the big one. Because, I mean, they, they, they don't stop. I mean, they'll, you know, if you give them any kind of break, they're going to they're gonna expose you. But on the natural bottom, it's not quite that way. You know, you can you can actually fight that fish and not even have not to have to use the boat to your advantage because there's just not as much you can do. I'll say this, too. You know, you get on a boat with some people that ain't ever really jigged for them, and they jig for them like they're trying to catch a bass or something. Right. You, it, it's a cardiovascular workout. Oh, yeah. If you don't have a sore armpit and you don't think you're looking silly, you're not doing it right. Yeah. You That's need to right. be burning that thing through the water if you're going to get bites. Yep. It, the one, you know, usually when we tr- when I actually try to go out and, you know, have people that are looking for them, I always tell them to come. You know, I, they need to be there that you know, as soon as season opens, so we can go out there and get on them because they, you know, they get a lot of pressure put on them. You know, and, they, and there's, I don't, I don't know how the, st- I really am not a, I don't really have a good judge on the stock. I know that's been a issue of debate kind of this week. People have been talking about because they're kind of monitoring that a little more. So we'll see. You know, we'll see yeah. how it really is. I, I'm sure we'll try to try to go after some at some point this weekend. Yeah, I'll be curious to well, see. Uh, I'm sure. I think people will. I think people will catch them pretty good. Angelo, you it's said it's going to be a busy weekend. Anybody out there, just about everybody I talk to, I the weather's going to be perfect. Too. It's going to be good. Well, good, man. Thanks, Chris, for that question. I hope that we helped you out. Chris Fix is going to get a prize pack from the Slick Lure. Chris, make sure you email us at alabama at bestfishingreport.com to redeem your Slick Lures. Y'all send us your hate cap questions at alabama at bestfishingreport.com or follow our Facebook page. I always make some posts over there, and you'll get your Slick Lure package if we pick your question. Man, Dustin, we appreciate you being on, buddy. And be yeah, careful this be weekend. Here. Yeah, man, be careful this weekend. All right. Mate. Yeah, I don't hope to get something good. Hey, buddy, talk to you soon. All right, Angelo, I appreciate you co-hosting me this week, man. Man, I always feel flattered when I get that little text message for you from you. <laughs> hey, you got it? available today or tomorrow. That's right, man. It's a good show. It's going to be some good information. I'm excited about it. Excited to get this one out to the people. I think they're going to like it. I think it's going to be a really good show. Good stuff this week. For sure. All right, buddy. We know we, know we got to do that. What'd you learn today? And this week's What'd You Learn is brought to us by the Florabama Fishing Rodeo. It's that time again. The funnest fishing tournament on the Gulf Coast is back and better than ever. The Florabama Fishing Rodeo has categories that range from swordfish to sail cats. There's a kids division and an, and an adult division, which means there's a way for everyone to compete and win top of the line prizes. A portion of the ticket sales will be donated to Operation Reconnect, a nonprofit organization geared to providing combat veterans coming back from deployment a week-long free vacation to reconnect with their family. That's awesome, man. I'm excited to hear that. I know you know a little bit about the Florida Bound Fishing Rodeo. Just a teeny tiny bit. <laughs> <laughs> this year's rodeo will be June 12th through June 14th, and it's easy to register. Just go to fishfloribama.com for tickets and more details. And I know we're at uh, SKA sanctioned event this year. So nice. King Mackerel guys ought to be happy about that again. Heck yeah. Well, well dude. Lots of great info this week, but what did you learn? Man, I think, and, and it's the age old question, you know, I guess it's what they call match the hatch, right? What color lure to what, you know, what circumstance? And I really loved your question. You asked Bobby, why, why does that matter? You know, when do you use what color? And he broke it down as far as, you know, water clarity, light. Thought that was cool. That's what I learned. I, I, I will definitely be applying that to my inshore repertoire. Well, you know, like when you don't know a lot about it, sometimes you can come up with a decent question every now and then. And he did a A plus on explaining that and the theory behind it. I just thought it was very applicable. And especially right now when we're going to have mixed water conditions between high high river stages and low river stages, it uh, couldn't be more timely, I don't think. Agreed, man. 
Well, like I said, man, I appreciate you co-hosting this week. And if people want to look up some real estate and get with you over there in Orange Beach, Gulf Shores area, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Dude, find me on Facebook, The Coastal Connection. It is starting to heat up. Real estate's moving. It's good. I think we see a light at the end of the tunnel, and I hope all our, um, you know, me and you are business guys. I hope all our business owners and workers and all are starting to feel better now, right now. Me too, man. Me too. It's been a sketchy time, and um, I think we're on the up and up, so all we can hope for is the best. Yep. All right, well, folks. Tight lines this weekend. That's right. You guys get them. There's going to be a lot of people in the water this weekend. You guys, please be safe. Use your etiquette. Be safe with your wakes. And uh, that's going to wrap up the show this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, head over to greatdaysoutdoors.com forward slash ASFR. And we'll send you the new show each week. Thanks again, Angelo. You guys keep whacking them. Fist bump you. I would. I just do it right now. Boom. Social distancing fist bump. (laughs) Later, Later, guys. See y'all next week. See ya. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by GEICO. Call Ron Davis, GEICO agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash AL. And also fish bites. Fish bites stay on the hook longer than any natural bait. Check them out at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by Day Cool Heating and Air, your home performance specialist. Contact them at 251-260-3858 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com. License number AL07028. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo DiPaola. The Coastal Connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo DiPaola Realtor, The Coastal Connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. Also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com.